We raised $205 million for the idea of connecting the physical world, something you had in your hand, to the virtual world. Mm. And through that, we got to meet with Ron Howard and Steven Spielberg and all the media creators. Welcome to another episode of Forging the Future, and today I'm speaking with Dave Matthews. Dave's an investor, and he's also the CTO, the Chief Technology Officer at Softec Venture Studios. So well, thank you for being here, Dave. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me as the CTO, and we just spent an action-packed week with our latest group of cohorts, 20-something this time? 20 plus, yeah. Unbelievable. Our largest one so far. Exciting. It's been a crazy week. Great founders, by the way. So some interesting tech, which I know you uh, you love as much as I do. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about your career. Um, I know you've had quite a varied amount of experience. So I'll try to see if you can put it in a nutshell. Yeah, so I started tinkering and, and having that amazing curiosity for electronics and being mm-hmm. able to build things. So when I was a, a kid at the teenage years, I was the librarian for the Osborne Computer Club. And the Osborne oh, really? had five and a quarter floppy disks, a mm. five inch screen. And back then, BBSs were only going 300, 1200 baud. So downloading software was a you know terrible experience. Mm. Baud means bits per second of like an impossible download a file. Mm. So being the librarian, I had access to all the software. And I'd go to the computer club meetings and trade disks for people and stuff. So who owned it? It was the, the school's the f- computer? No, it was the first Osborne group. So the, the library oh. was the Osborne club, but okay. the computer was my dad's. I'm, my oh. dad would bring this home on the weekends and after work because mm. the Osborne was luggable. In mm. fact, at the Computer History Museum, you can pick one up. They have mm. one set up. And to this is pre-compact luggable, exactly. right? Yeah. yeah. I think I actually worked at one company. I was, it was a job doing drafting. And back then it was pencil and paper. Uh-huh. But they actually had an Osborne. Secretary was using, I wasn't using it. So, yeah. uh, but it was kind of my first exposure. And the Osborne did something unique. They bundled the software with mm. the hardware. Mm. So, you got a calculator program, a VisiCalc kind of thing. You got mm. a, our SuperCalc, it was called. Um, that you had WordStar, the word processor, and um, it was oh, the first D- database, DBase, <laughs> DBase 3, I think it was. Mm. So, my dad would bring it home for me, and I'd always take it apart because I wanted to make it from. 50 columns to 80 columns mm-hmm. or double density drive um, versus the single density that it and came with. And how old were you at this time? I'm like 12, 13. Okay. I just want to tear and your this dad let you take the computer well, apart? It, uh, turns out that became a problem because mm. he wanted to use a computer for work. So mm. I ended up getting my own. Okay. And these things were, what, 1600 bucks at the time. So mm. not, a, not a small amount. But as I go to the computer clubs, I started meeting other computer people. And I started figuring out the collaboration was a way to go. Mm-hmm. So I wanted a BBS on my own and I couldn't afford the $30 a month phone bill. <laughs> so I said, well, if I could get an ad to show when you called my BBS, then I could pay for that $30 phone bill. But trying to get a company to spend $30 a month on an ad back in the eighties, it's too impossible. So there's this brand new technology coming out called caller ID. Now imagine mm-hmm. what if you could know who was calling you before you picked up the phone? Mm-hmm. I mean, now we take that for granted, right? right. But back then, You could buy a little box, hook the box up to your phone line, and it would show you who was calling. And the new 2400 baud modems had this technology available. So I met a guy at the computer club, Dave Mullenhoff, and I said, Dave, could you write a BBS software for my Osborne? He had a K-Pro, I had an Osborne, This both CPM CPUs, but when you wrote back then it was assembly language, Mm -hmm. and every CPU had different registers. So I said, the big thing is I want to understand the number calling in and pass that data to the computer. And that way I could show an ad if you called from a different area code or a different exchange. Mm -hmm. So I had this kind of idea of like giving the right information at the right time based upon caller ID. Mm. And Google did that with Google search, of course. And then Dave brought over a floppy disk. A multi-billion dollar idea. With caller ID. 12 years old. Yeah. (laughs) But uh, Dave brought over a floppy disk. He drove over in his Fiero, which Mm. you remember the great automotive uh, Pontiac uh, technology that was. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, Dave Matthews, you changed my life. I'm now going to be a programmer. Mm. So he went on to create Salesforce with Mark Benioff. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. But he said, um, years later, 2005, when I was doing another project, I emailed him and said, I don't know if you remember me. He goes, yeah, you changed my career. <laughs> so I'm kind of like the Forrest Gump of uh, connecting people. Did you say my address for the check <laughs> is? <Exactly. laughs> no, I wish I would have spent that hundred bucks on a, maybe a, a quarter share of uh, Salesforce back <laughs> yeah. then instead of 
right. the software. But hey, we all take our path there. Well, I learned something new. I had not heard that story. Thanks. But yeah, I love tinkering and curiosity and have worked with um, makers and builders and, mm -hmm. and try and create the impossible with good teams. And you know this, you've mm -hmm. built teams before. Yeah. And so you went all the way from that to being an inventor. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I was like an a inventor for hire. And mm -hmm. when I got a real job, I was doing all these startups and Radio Shack hired me to be their in-house inventor. Mm -hmm. And my parents were finally happy because it was a brand that they understood. <laughs> so wait a minute, how does uh, how how does someone get the job as an inventor at Radio Shack? Yeah, so um, it turns out they put about thirty million into one of the inventions that my team and I came up with in Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. called the QCAT. Okay, and the QCAT was early on the internet. It's like mm -hmm. 1996, 1997. We had a TV show teaching people what the internet was. Mm. And on that TV show, we would talk about websites and destinations. And then throughout the course of a week, I'd get emails saying, Dave, what was that site where you talked about whatever it was, satellite internet or how to look up homes on the internet? Remember in the 90s, the internet was brand new. A lot of people were on AOL and CompuServe mm -hmm. and still sending faxes. And uh, email. And only geeks knew about dot coms and everything else. That's right. right. When you tried to send an email, really, you could only send it if you were on AOL with everyone else mm -hmm. or a BBS with everyone else. There wasn't this idea of intermodal communication. Or even just uh, in your own company network. That's right. Mm -hmm. It was all intranets, mm -hmm. it was all local um, cruise ships, we called them back in the day. <laughs> so I wanted a way to send people to the websites I talked about without them having to take notes during the show. And back in the, the days, the TV was in one room and the computer was a tower PC in another room. Mm -hmm. So we came up with a way to use an audio tone that we were watching our show. Your computer would hear that audio tone. It sounded like a modem scrambled noise bit. Mm -hmm. uh, remember when your modem would connect back in the day and yeah. blast all these frequencies to see what the phone line would mm -hmm. support. So we did a similar noise over the television broadcast. And that noise could be recorded by your DVR, by VHS, whatever, or live, of course, and um, automatically hear the noise and then go to the website, either real time or go to the website later through mm -hmm. like caching this. So think about bookmarks for your browser, right? Mm -hmm. Bookmarks kind of went away because the website now does autocomplete or the browser does autocomplete. But mm -hmm. we were trying to do a bookmark for television. And then as we were like working on this product for our show, and it was really just so I wouldn't have to answer emails because on the weekends I like working on my old cars and my old boats. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to sit there and answer emails on what website we talked about. So it was a very self-fulfilling uh, solution there. But we said, you know, at the bottom of URL, I'm sorry, bottom of barcodes on products was a URL. Mm -hmm. And you saw this convergence of the 1990s about people trying, or brands trying to get you to go to the website. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the way DNS, domain name service works, you type in an address, you know, uh, softtech.com, and it's really just a series of numbers, mm -hmm. uh, which is the, the location on the internet. Well, we just took the location of the numbers for the barcode and ran our own DNS server, our own, own object naming service, and pushed that to the internet. Mm -hmm. And with that, we came up with a hardware device, which everybody loves hardware, and that's the QCAT. And it's this ridiculously <laughs> shaped device. Did you have one of these? I don't I did not have one. Okay. Well now you do. Okay. I, I have an autographed oh, QCAT. Oh nice. For you. Great. That's so the idea go with, on the shelf, I think. <laughs> so the idea with the QCAT is you now had an optical reader out of the nose mm -hmm. to read any barcode on any magazine, Forbes Wired, Ad Week, Brand Week, Parade. We raised $205 million for the idea of connecting the physical world, something you had in your hand, to the virtual world. Mm. And through that, we got to meet with Ron Howard and Steven Spielberg and all the media creators, because we also had this television and, and movie technology mm. that you would hear something in the broadcast, your computer would rather, and it would go to the website for it. And this was later called the worst invention of the decade by Time Magazine. Congrats. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and to that I say, who reads Time Magazine anymore? Uh, right? Yeah. So <laughs> uh, now the QCAT can still be bought on Amazon and eBay. And there's a tremendous um, hacker um, kind of movement behind opening up hardware that was a company would lock down. That's fun. And now you can unlock it. Even Slingbox, one of my other projects I was involved with, those DNS servers for Sling are going down. Mm. So there's an open source community of people opening those back up as well. That's going to happen probably uh, uh, at the end of the year here in 2022. So And it recently made the uh, Computer Museum, right? Yeah, so the Computer History Museum has a QCAT as one of the um, unique um, UX interfaces. Mm -hmm. They had a bunch of weird keyboards. Some of the keyboards 
uh, were up and down like this. So you, oh yeah, you I kinda, remember that one. You kind of type like Doctor Evil. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> so yeah, the uh, but because of the QCAT, Radio Shack manufactured this for it, mm-hmm. and instead of making it like a barcode reader, which would be very robust and metal and and have to work through millions of cycles. It was made like a mouse, mm-hmm. and it's only fitting because it, the the tongue and tongue in cheek design of this was a cat next to your mouse, mm. and that was the marketing nonsense that nice. uh, every good product needs or every bad product. Well, needs. I did know that you had invented the the Q cat. I actually I wore my my cat space cat socks today. Oh, as well a, done! In oh, homage of that. the. Uh, of your of your I like achievement. That. So right, because of that. the QCAT being made by Radio Shack mm-hmm. and a, a partner of us, we used them to help with a global experience of a uh, supply chain, right? Because mm-hmm. think about the 90s, Radio Shack had a 40-year history of building products in Asia. Right. And we just were inventors in Dallas thinking about this idea of converging the internet. Mm-hmm. And since we did the software version for the television, we needed the hardware thing. So Radio Shack was our expert there. So after the company, you know, 2001, there was a tremendous market uh, washout of companies with other w- bad ideas mm-hmm. um, that did not make enough money. And even Amazon <laughs> was part of that, right? Amazon got caught in that and its stock was nearly worthless. So um, what did happen through that, though, is I was trusted as a technologist by mm-hmm. some of those partners. And uh, Belo, which was uh, they own television stations throughout the U.S., they put me on air as their gadget guy. Mm. And Radio Shack, who knew me from working with their product development people, brought me on as their in-house inventor. Mm. So it was, even though the company was a, a, a demise, and not a single VC was harmed, by the way, because that <laughs> $205 million was all strategic money. Oh, really? Like Steven Spielberg put a million in. Um, Forbes, equivalent of $7 million. Mm-hmm. Um, wired about the same. So we really had a um, the idea of, the business to business investors going in to make this because mm-hmm. it was media companies that would ultimately benefit from it. So they mm-hmm. were our investors. Mm-hmm. So afterward, Radio Shack brought me in as their in house inventor. And that's when I worked on things like speaker light bulbs and a scale for eBay. Mm. And what I, what I saw is like people wanted music throughout their house, but it was too hard to run speaker wires. So mm-hmm. why not put speakers where lights are? Because lights have power. And lights are above your head where the mm. speaker might sound better. Mm-hmm. So we put very small speakers throughout your house. And like the the USB scale that we made for eBay, every scale had a display on it. But when you put an item on the scale, the display would be hidden by the item, the box. Mm. So I said, we don't need as humans to know what the scale value is. Mm-hmm. What we need is the computer to know. Right. So why not just every time you put an item on the scale, have it launch a website and fill in the form for you? Mm. Because the scale knows who you are and what the weight is. And all you have to type in is the ship to address. Mm. So we were creating products like that that were ultimately sold in the 7200 Radio Shack stores throughout the nation. Oh, wow. Well, I know you like to invent and you've invented small things and actually quite large things. And uh, tell me about this uh, 747 at Burning Man. Yeah, so I've been going to Burning Man now for 11 years. Mm -hmm. And for me, play is something that as an adult, you stop doing. Mm -hmm. And you stop playing because bills, kids, school, dance lessons, whatever. So That's one of the main reasons to have kids is you can go back and play with all the toys. There you go. I like that. (laughs) One of the benefits. (laughs) There you go. People don't look at you funny when you're... Playing with the going toys. through the toy aisle as well at the store. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've noticed that with my nieces and nephews. When I walk through the toy aisle, I'm like, mm. I'm not a creep. <laughs> I've got I've got nieces and nephews. So mm-hmm. anyway, so um Burning Man is in northern Nevada. It's a week long event, but people spend years building art and everything from hydraulically powered uh crab based cars to what my friends and I did was create a military truck into a double-decker dance club. Mm. And we can only get about 40 people on that double-decker dance club. And that one was called Charlie the Unicorn. And Charlie even made its way to a Quiznos commercial making fun of Burning Man. So um, (laughs) pretty funny to watch that. Nice. That art go mainstream. Um, But then as we built Charlie, we can only get so many people on it. So Mm -hmm. um, some friends of mine drew a line in the desert sand and the desert there, it's an ancient dried up lake bed and it's like talcum powder. It's essentially what's in walls, gypsum, Mm -hmm. drywall dust. So they drew a a thing in the sand that was like a plane fuselage. And um, we said, well, what if we turn a plane and make that a a driving art car? And 
if you do a plane, you have to do a 747 because it's iconic, you know, the mm-hmm. humpback whale shape, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So we figured out there's boneyards throughout the U.S. and you can buy a plane. You can buy several different types of planes. You get planes with interiors, without interiors. You get ones with liveries on the side or without. And since Burning Man has a policy of having no brands and no commodification or, or sales, we had to get a white plane fuselage. We wanted no interior because we wanted it to be a dance floor inside. And after a, um, a lot of negotiations and figuring out how to do this, we bought one out of the Mojave, which is the airport where Burt Rattan was building the Strato Launcher and the, um, the Virgin Galactic vessel. Mm. So the funny thing is like, we've got some of those brilliant people volunteering and working on this project to turn a old non-flying end of life 747 into a bar. And you have Burt Rattan building future devices that will, you know, fly into outer space. So <laughs> both ends of the spectrum. Exactly. Exactly. So we finally, after five years, were able to cut the plane into sections and deliver it to Las Vegas. I'm sorry, north of it's in Vegas now. That's why I was thinking that, but deliver it north of Reno, 500 miles away. And for four years, this vehicle made its appearance there in two years it was driving around just like we how do you it. get a non-flying 747 from wherever you bought it to Reno and then 500 miles to Burning Man yeah where Burning Man has a requirement you can't leave anything there either yeah. right so you got to get it there and off again off. yeah we had we had tons of plans we had a 40 page safety document mm-hmm. we thought we could being smart guys we could just rent trucks and drive it across the road but now there's a network of people that allow what items will be covering up two lanes of the road. Mm -hmm. So we had to talk to the good old boy network and go through official channels and get permits in Nevada and permits in California in order to drive this. And um, once we got it there and assembled it, we were just like the banks in 2008. Do you remember the tagline for the banks then? No. They were too big to fail. Oh, yeah. So what happened with the plane is when we were driving around the middle of the playa, it was hard pack dust. And people go out there all year. They drive little dirt bikes out there. They drive quads. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of groups that go up there and shoot rockets off on the playa. But when we drove the playa to the edge, it becomes like snow where it's crispy on top and fluff below. Mm. So as we drove the plane off the edge of the playa, it fell through. Mm. And when it fell through, then we ran into some issues because now we have to bring semis out there to pull it back out of the playa. And then we had to build what's called a crane mat where we build roads with four inch thick polycarbonate, thousand pound mats. And we had to build an Egyptian road, drive the plane, unbuild the road, build more road, drive it over that, unbuild it, build more. And this is all your idea of fun. Yeah, exactly. It turns out (laughs) it was fun until it wasn't just like the banks were too Mm -hmm. big to fail. Mm -hmm. And then we had to like, had this new expense of the road to to make it there because we had to rent these road pieces. Mm -hmm. And then the the government had to approve where we were going to park it. And we can't, crush these fish that are, are not fish. They're little shrimps that are shells of hab- hibernated uh, sea life under the playa. It's a whole mess. Mm. But anyway, we got all the permits done. We had to wait on some government issues, but we got it both on, I'm sorry, off the playa, then back on. And at that time it's 2019. We're like, this is costing us a hundred thousand a year to just to drive it off. So mm. we can't do that. So uh, the plane was sold to the Zappos team mm. and Zappos sold it just in April to another group. So it's going to be a part of Area 15, mm. which is a plane Area 51. Mm-hmm. And Area 15 has these discovery centers in Las Vegas and they partner up with Meow Wolf, which are other crazy builders of like Alice in Wonderland grocery store experiences. So the plane will be rebirthed as something that anyone can go to in Las Vegas. And I hope it'll be a place for weddings and bar mitzvahs. Wow. Very cool. A lot of work to do that, but um, we brought a thousand people together and I would joke while we were working on the the development, uh, to do the hard work, to to cut it in half, Mm -hmm. truck it up there. Inside of the plane, I taught people how to solder and we created a gigabit network with Mm -hmm. 300,000 LEDs and a canopy over your head. And I could control with software and the team that helped me on rendering the plane. Mm -hmm. We could control every pixel in space over your head and and, uh, just unbelievable what, an experience this was for people because it really blew people's mind that this could be brought from um, a a multi-million dollar aircraft into something that everyone could enjoy and see Mm -hmm. the inner workings of. 
And it became kind of like a TEDx spot on the mm. playa where people could mm. come and have talks about alternative fuel and technology. And people from Boeing, Delta, United, American, they would all come to the plane and talk about it and, and share their love and passion about aircraft inside of our fuselage. Nice. So Burning Man was just, what, a few weeks ago, last month, something? Yeah, yeah so I'm with a much smaller camp now, just mm. 50 people instead of 500. Okay. And I was playing with Mesh Network stuff. Yeah, speaking of which, what, what is this stuff in our little, yeah, little treasure box? box? Stuff here. Yeah. Yeah, so I've, I've got a couple different devices here. So this is um, a, a little product that's uh, open source hardware and, and the schematics and everything's available here. So you can download these and it's covered mm -hmm. in dust, So it is authentic. Nice. Um, so this has a U-Block CPU. It has a LilyGo uh, LoRa module and LoRa is a, a 900 megahertz network. Mm -hmm. And then a little display and you can put a, a cell. And this is the same cell that there's 4,000 of these in your Tesla. Oh, nice. So um, you can power this up and it gets a GPS signal from the sky mm -hmm. and then it builds a mesh network to the device you have with the matching antenna. Okay. So here. what you would do with these things is you would put them one on an art car and one at your camp mm -hmm. and the camp is a fixed location, right? You're, you always know how to get back home to your camp, but what you don't know is where your art car is. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times your art car goes out with the crew who, who drives it and you're maybe back at home showering or eating dinner and you want to find, you want to meet up with your people. And the air car is cool because you've got maybe a double decker view or music on it or whatever. So what I created to experiment with at Burning Man using this LoRa network is this GPS receiver would go on the art car and the display on the, the matching device at camp would show me how many meters away the art car was in which direction. Mm -hmm. So it was all time of flight. So you could figure out where it was and you'd be like, oh, I can get there in 10 minutes on my bike. Mm -hmm. Nice. A little easier to get these things out to the... Uh the playa. Yeah. And you, there's no cell <laughs> network there either. Yeah, right. Right. So these things are small, they're compact. They use their own little wireless network and you can find your stuff. Now the other device is this one here. Yeah. This is what I've been thinking about. This is a, a raspberry Pi nano mm -hmm. and the nano is the smallest raspberry Pi. It's $6. And this has two boards snapped on the back of it. Mm -hmm. The the nano has Wi-Fi, so we can run, I've got a company called new air that I've been working on for about a dozen years, which is using radio waves as a service RAS. Mm -hmm. And uh, RAS, you're like, well, I've never heard of that. Well, that's because I made it up, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, like we like to do on anything, right? <laughs> that's so. right. So I'm trying to make it stick. Okay. So RAS. So, so the it. idea with RAS is this uh, little Raspberry Pi runs Python. Mm -hmm. And I've got two scripts running on it. One of them is to grab the GPS, which is a secondary board, grab a GPS signal every two seconds. Mm -hmm. And then it also runs a second service to scan for Bluetooth, which is this backboard, and Wi-Fi, which is on board, to give me a signal strength of the devices I see. Mm -hmm. And those devices can be your Apple Watch, your Fitbit, your um, cell phone, anything that's on Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, mm -hmm. it's beaconing, always trying to connect. Mm -hmm. And think about what's happening lately with natural disasters. Right, This just happened in Florida where uh, whole beaches were washed out and homes are collapsing on top of themselves. Mm -hmm. So the thought with this is it's very lightweight. It takes um, very low power and we could put this on a drone and it could be a consumer drone or it could be a FEMA drone. Mm -hmm. And we can fly this over an area and we can capture all those beaconing signals from both Bluetooth devices and Wi-Fi phones because there's no power there. There's no cell phone coverage in these natural disasters. Mm -hmm. We can associate those signals and that signal strength with the GPS position. And then we can find areas that we might want to send a truck in or send a boat in to do rescue. Oh, rescue, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I'm working on with my team at New Air as a way to take radio signals, which could be like a heartbeat of life that mm -hmm. your phone's going to last for maybe you know a few hours after a disaster without recharging it. But if we can send a drone overhead and capture this data and uh, save lives faster. So that's what I'm thinking about with this. And it's all right. open source, you know, easy to buy hardware. Nice. And tell me a little bit about what you're doing in the Venture Studio. Yeah. So years ago, I was with a team that helped start Make Magazine mm -hmm. and making makers and celebrating what we called the greatest show and tell on earth. Which I love was, Make Magazine. Yeah. And Maker Fairs, mm -hmm. they're, they're syndicated like TEDx. They're all over the world. Right. And I've been to Maker Fairs in Estonia and all over the world. And 
my favorite thing from 2004 that I'd ever did was making makers and, and make, saying it's okay to void your warranty mm-hmm. and take stuff apart and hack <laughs> it and fix it. And I did that with Dale Doherty and Tim O'Reilly and other friends like Bunny, the guy that hacked the first Xbox and Joe Grand who builds the badges for DEF CON. And we had a who's who of people hacking hardware. Mm-hmm. So with the Soft Tech Venture Studio, I'm acting as the CTO of all the startups that come in which is amazing because you have IoT devices, you have apps, you have databases, you have web services, on and on and on. Software, hardware. You name it, the mm-hmm. whole gamut. Mm-hmm. And every quarter, a new dozen plus companies come in and we vet hundreds on the beforehand side, which I see a lot of those, not all of them, but a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And we figure out what those companies need to get from zero or maybe you know MVP to hero, which is in some cases it's version one of the product. In other cases, it's an MVP because they might not have anything. Right. And what I love doing that is helping like all the mistakes that I've had with the, the worst invention of the decade with a QCAT or Slingbox. We actually won an Emmy with, we won mm. a tech Emmy with that. And, really? And I, designed, I had a Slingbox actually tried to use it in Belarus to get some U S stations, yeah. to, something that wasn't Russian. Right? That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now everything's gone to the cloud. So the mm-hmm. sling box, that's why it's being end of life to the mm-hmm. end of this year. But, and um, I designed a game with the black eyed peas that went number one in two days. And I've got this history of, of thinking what technology can do. And Moore's law of course is, is making this, you know, phenomenally fast. Mm-hmm. And then what will humans do with that technology? And that's, that's been the big problem. The reason why the QCAD failed was a lot of, Reporters said it was a, a solution looking for a problem, mm-hmm. meaning I could just go type in the name of the product on to your Googler and get information back on that product. But mm-hmm. when we built this thing in 97, Google didn't exist. It was Yahoo. Didn't have QR codes or anything There's no either, QR right? codes, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, so what I love about helping the team that you put together with the Venture Studio is being able to take all this input from all these different companies, very rapidly put my head in their shoes and say, all right, for this CEO or this CTO that's on board with this team to be successful, they're going to need to have X, Y, and Z. And how do we get them there fastest and most effectively? Because we have a short window to do this. It's mm-hmm. a three month, one quarter cycle to go from zero to hero. Mm-hmm. And um, it's my favorite thing is watching these entrepreneurs, watching their faces light up when we can unlock codes and crack codes for uh, their success. Nice. Speaking of codes, RPM record speeds. There it is. <laughs> we got it. Very good. It just came to me like ten seconds ago. It just I, I just put it in the back burner and let yep. it rattle there around. And all of a sudden, it just went zing. Yep. Okay, so I got it. So thirty-three and a half, forty-five. Uh, forty-five were singles. Ninety-nine mm-hmm. cent records you'd buy at Target. Right. And then what's interesting, if you add these two up, it makes seventy-eight. And seventy-eights were the first records, the very thick ones, made out of not vinyl but bakelite. Bakelite. Yep. Mm, I've never had a Bakelite record. I did one of my first uh, hacker stories, I guess, is uh, when I was a teenager, I bought a uh, a, a Seaberg Rockola jukebox yeah, okay. that someone was selling in a garage sale that was non-functioning and uh, worked all summer on restoring it. And it played 45s. 45s, yeah. And it had a selection mechanism, all mechanical, all right? Mechanical. It would like search mm-hmm. along. And, and I tried to like upgrade the tech. So I put a, a, a reed switch in yeah. the side of it, which was a, it's a magnetic switch. So the way it works, very simple, right? If you put it in a magnetic field, the two things connect. And, and you know, so I, so my idea was basically, and happy days was popular in yeah. those days. And so um, I'm a little jealous if you work with Ron Howard. But anyway, I wanted to be like, I'd have a magnet in my hand and go up there and basically do like the Fonzie move and like get credits. So Fonzie and, used uh, to bump the jukebox yeah. to get it to play free music for yeah, him. Exactly. And it was uh, such an iconic move. And mm-hmm. then you could have a magnet hidden in your hand. And that goes to my favorite quote from Arthur C. Clarke that any sophisticatedly advanced technology should be indistinguishable for magic. And that is beautiful. Magic. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah. So it was a fun project. Uh, definitely fun to do. Although I, I replaced all the vacuum tubes, replaced all the capacitors. I was doing all this. I could never get the sound quality quite up to what I wanted. And I didn't want to like just throw in a, you know, a digital amp. Exactly. Or a right. Transistor so, amp back then. I guess yeah. So I, I, I wanted to stay true to the tech and try to get it working. I must have list, I, you know, one of the records I had in there was uh, Kenny Rogers, uh, the Gambler record. So I must have listened to that, but you know, like, I don't know how many hundreds of times trying to get this thing, trying to figure out, you know, what, what's wrong with this? And, you know, I, I, 
And so I never did quite get there with it. So I, I've got an old Philco Predicta TV, which mm. is the TVs from the fifties that yeah. look like space, you know, Jetsons TVs. Right. And trying to fix the capacitors in that was a never ending battle because they're mm -hmm. paper wrapped caps. Right. So I just took the CRT stuff out and put in an LCD from Samsung and mm. hid it inside the chassis. So yeah. Sometimes you got to go new school. Well, and now I have a, uh, my jukebox is, is, is like the bubbler Wurlitzer yeah. and it's got the CDs in it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then I put all the CDs in it, but then I, uh, I actually bought some CDs that look like 45s. Oh, and my good. idea was to copy the CDs onto the 45s so it still looked like 45s in this you know yep. new version of the jukebox. But then I never quite got there to spend the time on, I do, I still have the jukebox and everything, but Just that, do was vinyl, like, 45 that was, vinyl. That was the last piece of thing that I wanted to really add. And then this, uh, and then I finally got rid of my jukebox, and this was before eBay, right? And of course, you know, I, I just, I just let some guy take it, you know, just for like, hey, please take this out of my living room, right? Yeah. You know, I was, and this is when I was buying the new bubbler Wurlitzer and everything, and so. But later, of course, the Seaberg jukebox, I look on eBay, and it's I don't know, worth forty five thousand dollars or exactly. something like that, and it's like, oh man. Anyway, um, so that's interesting. Uh, any brushes with greatness besides the ones you've already named off, Dave? <laughs> yeah, so, so. so the um, I've had a, an interesting career. I, I spent a year working with Bill Gates, and mm. I, he had 800 patents that he wanted to spin out into companies. Yeah. So I got did to see Did you work directly him. with him? I mean, you were in so the same I, room? So I was in the same room. <laughs> okay. Um, I did not report to him, mm -hmm. um, but he had... Uh, 830 patents that he wanted to be brought to life with products. Mm. And I worked with um, Intellectual Ventures Lab, which was Nathan Mirhold and oh, yeah. the former um, Microsoft CTO. Turned and, um, uh, um, chef, chef cook, yeah. author. Yeah, kind of, I've got his set of books, amazing yeah. books. Yeah, he did molecular gastronomy books yeah. and then a bread book and now a pizza book. Oh, really? So now he's really into um, food and figuring out yeast and um what kind of water makes a bagel taste great. And what's amazing is in the lab, we had this Babbage computer, which only two exist. Even mm. Charles Babbage wasn't able to make it. Mm. And up the Babbage computer smelled of oil because it was an oiled uh, total loss system. So you had to drip oil on it. And the underneath, meaning total loss, was a pan of oil where the oil would catch the oil dripping through the computer. Mm. But then when you walked in, you smelled that. But upstairs, you smelled the most amazing bread and pizza. So um, working with him was a, a trip because they had some of the most brilliant physicists I've ever met in my life. And I go to lunch with them when we would talk about everything from CRISPR to crispy dough. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. So let's do a speed round. Okay. Quick, quick answers. Uh, any, any books you'd recommend or currently reading? So I am a writer and a content creator mm -hmm. and I have all these books in my Kindle, all these books around my house. And I loved when I got started my career, I was reading about Richard Branson and Bill Gates and, mm -hmm. and those very influential entrepreneurs. But, um, then in the, like the early two thousands, I started writing for make magazine. I wrote for PC magazine. I'm mm -hmm. hanging out with John Dvorak and mm. being on his podcast with him. And, nice. and, um, I became more of a content creator instead of a consumer. Uh, so for me with the, every week I, uh, host a show called what's next wall street where I'm reading everything, Chris, you would name it, <laughs> you, you, any kind of digital entity talking about what's going on with blockchain and NFTs, which those all fascinate me. But really, it's no different from Avon or Amway. Mm. Um, it's a it's a race to see who can get into the top and then sell multi level marketing downstream. So I do this podcast on that and talking about what Elon's doing and the stock market and meme stocks and how this relates to Reddit. And um, so lately, the I'm more into a content creation mode than okay. a consumption. Nice. Yeah, that's fascinating. I'm a subscriber. Favorite gadget. Favorite gadget for me, it was my TiVo for years. Because mm. think about the TiVo. Oh, yeah. I was an early TiVo user. And then hacked it, by the way. I'm sure you did yeah, too. Yeah, doubled the capacity. Yeah, exactly. Put Ethernet port in it, mm -hmm. got rid of the dial-up. Mm -hmm. So the TiVo was my gadget that was used for nearly 20 years. A single gadget. Think about that. Mm. What can you say about a platform to have a 20-year... And, of course, Linux, you know. They got it right. The UI, the UI was amazing. Yep. Mm. But since then, you know, I, I talk about the iPhone having this modality of sensors all coming together. And mm -hmm. I designed this game for the Black Eyed Peas in 2010, where you use the accelerometer in the phone mm -hmm. to remix Black Eyed Pea music. Okay. And speaking of the record motif, the interface was a record that had unwound itself mm -hmm. into space. So the game was called Rhythm Ribbon. Okay. And rhythm is a slang for rhythm in mm -hmm. Jamaica. 
And ribbon is slang for what the record looked like when it was unwound. Mm -hmm. And using the accelerometer of the phone to create new experiences was like, oh, wow, this iPhone really has some some extensibility to it that people aren't thinking about. Because back at the time, Guitar Hero had a, a mobile phone version. And essentially, you just use your fingers to play the guitar like mm -hmm. banging on the screen. Mm -hmm. So for me, the iPhone is like, you pay $1,000 for something that you use for everything, mm -hmm. right? I, on my show, I had a Lazy Susan where I had a television set, a camera, a video camera, an MP3 player, and um, a, a two-way pager. And like all those five things, which I probably paid back in the day, 400, 500, dollars for each of those things are now in the thousand dollar iPhone. Mm -hmm. So what I'm excited Among about others, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I'm most excited about is thinking about how we can take this device we carry with us every day and extend it to do more things like mm -hmm. the radio scanning or things that are non-obvious. Like, mm -hmm. um, Apple's just allowed vehicles like BMW to use your phone to unlock the door. Really? So I'm thinking about how you can hack APIs to get more out of what you already have in your purse or your pocket, mm -hmm. not your purse. I bet you don't take it apart, though. I do. You um, do? And those screws, okay. the, the, the hardware that they're requiring you to own to get into the iPhones now mm -hmm. are crazy. And um, a lot of times, though, it's be harder than a watch. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, if you look at the, if you want to get see how tough it is, just look at an iFixit video. They do oh. a teardown whenever any new device from mm -hmm. Apple comes out. They do a tear down and show you how complex it is to get into it. And I used to replace the backs of them or replace the batteries and all that. And now you really need some sophisticated equipment to mm. heat the devices up to get them to unseal because they're much more waterproof than they were when you first got them. Mm, yeah, thankfully. Exactly. So what are you doing to help forge the future? Although most of this conversation was about that. But anything else you want to add? It. So, so with... I'll, I'll say this. I think I'm on the right path to enable and, and I, I want to inspire, which is great. Mm -hmm. A lot of, think about how many home improvement shows there are and how many shows showing you how to mix, like, you know, fix something on your car or remix something in your life. Mm -hmm. But that's just entertaining. And what I really want to do is motivate. So inspire, motivate. Okay. And what I love with the, whether it's the 747 teaching people how to solder or with Make Magazine, getting people excited about building stuff for Maker Fair, or with what I'm doing to help SoftTech, which is enabling 100 people a year to bring their their ideas into a tangible product, mm -hmm. is uh, it's it's my uh, dream come true, and I'm happy to be a part of all these weird things that all have a common thread, which is that motivation for success. Nice. So where can people find you or connect with you? Yeah, so I'm on at GGDM with most of the social networks. And that stands for Gadget Guy Dave Matthews. Because okay. it turns out there's some other guy with a similar name as mine. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really. Might have trouble Googling you. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, GGDM. Yeah, GGDM on the social networks and okay. Twitter and Instagram and you name it. But, okay. uh, you know, if uh, if you've got that good idea at home, why don't you apply to the Soft Tech Venture Studio and that's, um, you can Google that one, Soft Tech Venture Studio. And uh, let's see what you got. Let's see if you can impress the gadget guy. <laughs> and then what's something new and exciting that uh, we should be looking forward to, whether that's from you or just in general? Yeah, so the um, for me, it's this Laura. It's these new networks mm -hmm. and eSIMs and Apple. Um, I think right now the carriers kind of have us held hostage. Mm -hmm. And if you can go to an eSIM, like when I go to Europe, I download a SIM for each of the countries that I go to. And I only pay like five or 10 euros for a SIM that lasts me for a week or a month. Mm. And um, with LoRa, this this new radio device technology where you can make things talk in a mesh network. And I'm using Meshtastic, which is a, a fantastic open source Meshtastic. device uh, kind of like overlay on top of this hardware. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really into communications and, and how we can communicate uh, further, better, and um, without encumbrances of of hundreds of dollars per month. Like my cell phone bill is 300 a year. So. Nice. So Dave, you know, I like to wear different kinds of socks. Yep. I told you I've got my uh, the, cat the rocket cat socks. Inspired, and, yeah. I've got some soft tech socks with the rockets on them, which are cool. Nice. So I've got you a pair of socks. Yours got a sailboat. I know you nice. like to travel. Nice, yeah. Um, this is so, good. I think, um, you know, the sailboat is I don't is know if you good. have any socks on today. But, I just, uh, you know what I do? I, you know how Steve Jobs had one costume he wore all the mm, time? Mm -hmm. I couldn't do that. But what I did do is buy all the same socks. So uh, I don't yes. ever have to spend time matching them. Perfect. I just throw them all in the wash. And when they get uh, torn or haggard, 
I just throw out the bad one and then I've got a, a hundred backups behind it. So, <laughs> nice. but this is beautiful. Well, in a pinch, you can use those. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm, now that I'm spending more time in Houston with you and the team, mm -hmm. I'm actually looking for a sailboat to build as my, um, my aquatic escape vehicle. So oh. this is, this is very meaningful for me. And thank you so much. Sure. My you. first Houston sailboat right there here. There you go. <laughs> Thanks for being on the pod. <laughs>